Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 225, which reads as follows. Ahingsaka ye munayo nichanka ye na sanguta te yanti ajutang tanang yatagantwa na sochari which means non-violent those sages ever restrained in body they go to a place they never fall away from where having gone one suffers not or one sorrows not This verse was apparently taught in response to a question that relates to a story uh, about the Buddha when he was living near Saketa. The story goes that there was a Brahmin living in the area. And when the Buddha went on alms around this Brahmin, saw the Buddha walking and rushed up to him and said, My son, my son, what are you doing? Where have you been? Where have you been? Why have you not come home? Why have you not come to see us? And he invited the Buddha to his house and to his wife and, and his wife said the, 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 the Brahmin woman said My son, where have you been? Why have you not come to visit? And they called out all of their children and said Come, come, pay respect Your brother is a, is a, a rishi Is an ascetic Come and pay respect to your brother And the Buddha was silent and he waited through it patiently and they asked the Buddha, they said, Our son, please, you must come to eat at our house every day. Why would you go anywhere else when you're in, our, in your home, when you're near us, your parents? And the Buddha said, Oh, it's not the way, it's not our way to, to go to the same place regularly. You know, Buddha's way is to support and and commune with so many with all sorts of different people by moving, by traveling. And they said, "Well, then, please send us monks, send us your followers, send us other followers of your teaching, other monks, and we'll to care for them." And they did this and. Whenever the Buddha was free, he would go to their house and again and again they listened to his teachings and they came to the monastery, always calling him our son. And they became anagamis throughout this time. They practiced the Buddha's teaching and listened to his teaching and became devout followers and were, were successful in becoming the anagami the non-returner, meaning when they passed away they would never be reborn again. They had given up all greed, all anger, all sensual greed anyway, and all anger. They were very pure. And so the monks took this up as a topic of conversation one day, asking, you know, what's going on here? Not only do these Brahmin people erroneously you know, label the Buddha as their son, the Buddha doesn't correct them. They know that the Buddha has a father and a mother, Suddhodana and uh, uh, Mahapajapati. They were, they were his parents. 
and the Buddha, the Buddha you know, doesn't bother to correct them. It's the, it's, it's quite quite exceptional. And the Buddha heard them, and he said, "Oh, you want to know the reason why they call me their son?" And he told a story of the past, the Jataka, and he said, "In five hundred lifetimes, in five hundred births, both of these two lovely people were my parents." In 500 births, they were my aunt and uncle. And in 500 births, they were my grandparents. So again and again and again, we were related. And as a result, this perception, this recognition has stuck with them. From that time on, they, the story goes on to say that they spent the rains... Uh, with the Buddha, that the Buddha relied upon them, and for the during the three months of the rainy season, he went ever and again to their house, and through his guidance, they uh, they became arahant and passed away. And when they passed away, the monks asked, they asked and asked the Buddha, "Where did they go, Venerable Sir?" Not realizing that they had become arahant, never to be born again. And the Buddha said, "Oh, people, sages like them." Special individuals, you know, quite exceptional, are never born again. They go to a place, where do they go? They go to a place that you'll never fall away from. And then he taught this verse. So the, the lesson of the story, if there is one, I think, especially relating to meditation, is in regards to perception and in regards to concept. Specifically, concepts of, of relationship. The story reminds us that our relationships are conceptual, based on our perceptions. Many of us, I think, can relate, not necessarily to the specific perception of these Brahman couple, but to, to this the general type of perception where you recognize someone who you've never met before you you they're in sharper focus than everyone else and your connection to them is quick and strong and lasting we we see this with people we just met for the first time and it might be good it might be bad it might be negative in the sense that we become enemies rivals it can be just as sharp as with friends but we, we generally don't look at family the same way. And this story gives us a, a reminder that even our family members are, are no less conceptual than our friends or the relationships with our friends and so on. Our loved ones, our, our lovers, our romantic involving uh, partners. Who's to say that these this couple... Is any less the Buddha's parents than Suddhodana or Mahapajapati or Mahamaya? Just because their their relationship with the Buddha is older, you know, has passed away, has, has changed. In the end, it all comes down to our perceptions. So, if there's any lesson to be had for for a meditator. It's to remind us that our uh, reification of things is just conceptual and helping us to see that our uh, perception of everything, of, of people and places and things and our attachment to things is based on this, this cultivation of a perception that builds up over time and, and with attention the more attention and the more focus we put on something, but if it's a person, then on our relationship, the stronger that uh, perception becomes. You know, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, it builds up. And that's the only reason why we are the way we are, and why we have the personality we have. Not because we were born with it. No, it's much deeper than that. It's because we cultivate it, and we've cultivated it, and continue cultivating it. And so meditation is very much a practice of 
refining and, and adjusting those habits, straightening out our personalities. We don't have to lose our personalities, just straighten them out. And what we lose, what we remove, are the ones that we see clearly for ourselves without any uh, reliance on others at all and that, uh, as being harmful and stressful and, and a cause for suffering. But the, the deeper lesson, of course, comes from the verse, as usual. And the lesson, I think, the, the main lesson from the verse relates again to this difference between worldly pursuits and spiritual or holy religious pursuits. Because it relates to violence. It relates to... Uh, Activity, unrestrained activity with the body. You know, acting on impulse, acting on ambition, acting on desire. This is the way of the world. It's a way that gets you what you want, very often. Anger, uh, violence. And by violence, not just physical violence, verbal violence, verbal conflict. Very often gets you what you want. Verbal manipulation, you know, physical acts of manipulation, of coercion, of threat, of intimidation, very often gets people what they want. And so the way of the world is one way. The way of the Dhamma is very different. And it's in stark contrast. Because the way of the world always, whether it relates to anger and violence or whether it relates to greed, which also has, has to do with violence, is ultimately about the reliance on certain situations to make you happy. We get what we want, we accomplish what we desire, we become proud and, and attached and, and identify with things. More and more we become dependent and reliant on them. We suffer from the anger of the violence, we suffer from the greed, the desire which, which stresses our, taxes our system. We suffer from the worry and the fear of other people's violence, you know, we suffer from, and, and their greed, the, the concern for losing what we have, from having it threatened. The more violent you are, whether it be through greed or anger, the more concerned you become, the more susceptible you become. Because you become familiar with loss, the concept of loss. Only someone who has something to lose suffers from loss. Only someone who is attached to the things that they have or the things they might get can suffer from losing or not getting what they want, what they like, what they want, what they need. And we suffer when we are when it is taken away, when we are conquered. The conqueror who is conquered suffers more than the one who conquers not. We suffer when we are taken advantage of when when we lose the things we want to others. We we the manipulator are manipulated. The greedy one has things taken from them. This is how we suffer. So it's constantly in a state of of, uh, of uncertainty. And this is the essence of the Buddha's teaching on uncertainty, on anicca, on impermanence. For someone who relies upon this king of the hill, king of the castle mentality where you can rise to the top you know? someone who rises to the top has that much further to fall no is that much more susceptible to loss and so it's well well it seems that the person who the person who wins who is victorious that they've got it made there is no way 
There is no instance There is no possibility For that to be lasting, permanent, stable To be any sort of, of everlasting goal no. Even putting aside death what, what, you know, The ultimate end to any accomplishment Any worldly accomplishment The simple reliance on victory you know, The simple frame of mind Is one that is, is unbalanced Requires this Is constantly stressed Constantly in a state of, of suffering you know, A person who gets what they want Feels so happy And thinks they are so happy They are so full of uh, Greed and anger and delusion They, cannot, they can't see that they, they can't see while they're suffering They can't see how, how tense and stressed And perverted their mind is How perverse the mind A person who is perverse Misses the fact that that perversion is a cause for suffering So we have this example of Worldly example of uh, police brutality And we have on the other side the, the, the example of protesters being angry and violent And you know, not to Well not to really get involved And, and Not not to sorry not to equiv equivalent equiv not to create an equivalence because clearly there is something to be to stand up and say something about clearly there is something wrong with the system the system is the system the society that we have built for ourselves is based on greed and there is there is a, a problem with what might be called police brutality and there's no question. And that's an issue that, that is worth standing up for and, and speaking out about and That being said, the take stepping back And looking from the point of view of, of all Who might wish for, for, for good things No good things come from anger, from, from violence Whether it be on the side of the police Who think they're so good <laughs> Getting, you know, getting their way, they have the power Not realizing how torturous it must be to be such a violent and cruel individual you know? Fearful, even How much, uh, there's apparently a greater amount of trauma Because they're under pressure, peer pressure from other police officers From their superiors and so on And on the other side of the protesters who have such a such a noble aspiration you know, to end racism, to end discrimination, to end cruelty, brutality, to end evil states of mind. Ultimately, they may not phrase it, they may not realize it, ultimately it comes down to evil states of mind. Without the evil states of mind, the unwholesome, the states of mind that cause stress and suffering, without those mind states there would be no Tension, or there would be no conflict, no. and so as a result, we it's self-defeating to increase and to cultivate anger. You know, it may get us what we want. It may even be the the the, the right solution. It may even be the solution, in the sense that in a worldly on a worldly level, it does change things for the better. But as a rule, and for our own spiritual health. For our own mental health and well-being Which ultimately is what it's all about For our own spiritual, mental health, mental well-being We can't succumb to anger and, and violence Ultimately we're self, it's self-defeating Because if, if the goal is to be achieved with anger and violence Then what kind of a goal is it? What is the result? If that's the outcome and we haven't really fixed anything It's not a world worth living in Even if it does Change So that's um, 
that's on the on the side of well that's the disadvantages to that and in opposition we have the way of the dhamma one who is non-violent one who is controlled kayena samutta which means controlled in body but the commentary says it doesn't just relate to body it's actually body speech and mind of course the buddha wasn't just praising uh, physical restraint Kaya Kaya often just means as a, in the being So it refers to all three This way is very different You know, we might put up an equivalence And say, well, what about you? Don't you aren't you attached to your way as well? Or so on no? We don't want to think that there might be one way One thing better than another One way of life better than another meaning we we quite often put up these false equivalences between different things so we have to point out the stark contrast between these two ways one is always inclining always reaching and the other is never inclining and never reaching never pushing and pulling the buddha said never coming or going where there is no coming and no going And so it, the, the, the issue of impermanence, of instability, is solved. Why the, the second part of the verse talks about uh, a permanent achutta. Chutta means falling away. Achutta, never fallen away. You can never fall away from it because it's, it's at the bottom already. It's at the base already. If something desirable comes, no matter how desirable, something desirable goes. If something undesirable comes, undesi no, no, it makes no difference. It it is a way of li way of being, a way of relating to reality. That is inherently, by its very nature, without any cause for doubt or uncertainty, stable. Consistent, unshakable, invincible. No. The, the question as to whether it or not it's such a such a state is possible or really exists. Well, that's that's the question that Buddhism seeks to answer and to to demonstrate. And that's where meditation comes in. Our practice of mindfulness. The question that often arises in pe people. Why are we repeating to ourselves something like pain, pain, or if we're angry, say angry, angry. If we want something, wanting. Why do we say to ourselves, seeing, seeing? Why are we doing this? Why are we reminding ourselves about these mundane realities? And this is the answer. We're trying to cultivate a state of objectivity where we relate to things just as they are. Because our actions, just like the actions of anyone who gets angry and violent or greedy and, and covetous and, and ambitious and so on, our habits have power and influence. They change us. And if we cultivate this state of objectivity where we're, we remember things, where we remember, oh yeah, I'm not going to forget that that's all, that's just pain. No. Because if you forget that that's just pain, you will get upset about it. When you see delicious food, for example, I'm not going to forget that that's seeing. Because if I forget, I will get caught up in all these concepts. Oh, I know what that tastes like, and that's something I like. And hmm. When you're angry, I'm not going to forget that that's anger. Because if I forget, if I lose track of the experience, I will get caught up by the anger, by the greed. I will become violent. I will become covetous. I will, I will be manipulative. I will do all sorts of things to get what I want and to remove what I don't want and so on. 
This is what it means to be restrained. Samutta. It doesn't mean you have to force yourself in any way, really. It means you have to keep the mind with the experience. Keep the mind in the reality of the experience. Not getting caught up in our reactions and our perceptions of things. So when the Buddha talks about this achutatana, achutang tanang, yatagantwa nasuchare, where one sor sorrows not, he's he's talking about at at its base this state, this way of life, way of being that one comes to through training and through practice of non-reactivity of non-judgment of simple, true and pure experience of reality as it is experience of this, of what we are all experiencing but experiencing it purely and truly and without judgment or reactivity because that is the way of life the way of practice that is the way that that carries on to eternity that has no uh, falling back you know there is no uh, tension in it there is no uh, opposition right when you strive and strive and strive to get something you build up and build up this attachment to it. When you live your life in objectivity, in clear awareness of things as they, they are, there is no build up like that. There is a shedding off. There is a freeing. And so the result, rather than a building up and a building up of some formation that is going to topple down, there is the deconstruction and there is a reduction in needs and attachment and the ultimate the ultimate destination the ultimate result is freedom from suffering in 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 a way very different from any conception of freedom from suffering that we we might have in a worldly sense because it is independent has nothing to do with samsara or our experiences of this or that, and so it's free and it's it's free from any of the uncertainty and the impermanence, the unpredictability of samsara of the world, and so there's no 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 fear of sorrow. From one who has gone to this place. That's the Dhammapada for today. Thank you all for listening.